Ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? My name's Craig Otto. I'm a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Thanks for joining me today. We're going to talk about part two of my White Belt training series. Uh, my intentions with the series to give you some basic insights and understanding of operational excellence, especially if you're just starting out on your journey. Um, if you haven't seen part one and part one uh, follow-up, to my series, be sure to check that out. There's two videos prior to this one. And um, obviously this part will build on those first two videos as well. So it's important you check those out. So let's um, get started today. I'm really excited about part two because it really starts to dig into the application of uh, the the training of the subject matter, right? Um, part one, we talked a lot about um, how it's important to uh, understand that this is a personal transformation and your role in sort of the cultural change, right? And, and anchoring your choices into the uh, foundation of excellence. And then with that, your individual behaviors that go along with it. So today, um, you know, knowing that we're going to learn more about how do you do that, right? So the first video and the follow-up to video one was about why um, cultural transformation is so important, why your personal transformation is important. This video jumps into how do you transform yourself, right? What What is it that you need to do? And so with that, I want to talk about your mission as a new white belt, and um, let's let's understand you know sort of your role as we get into this. So first of all, as said in in video um, one and part one follow up, um, your role is to anchor your behaviors into the guiding principles, which occurs by implementing lean tools and systems and to relentlessly attack and eliminate process waste, which also occurs by implementing lean tools and systems. Um, hopefully you're starting to get the hint here that how you transform is through the lean tools and systems. And then of course, um, there's, there's ways of doing this. So starting out as a white belt, really your, your role is to observe what's going on um, through these these process changes then you as you learn and learn the tools then you start to do it yourself and lead lead others to those right and then you mentor others so sort of a developmental thing here as as you um, learn about your white belt training and then of course again as I stated in the first couple videos to be a model of personal excellence all right, so now we know our mission. Let's talk about the overall goal. All right, this is, um, I will say this is what typically most white belt training begins with. Those first two videos that I did um, really uh, kind of set the stage. And most times, most trainers will not go through that. Um, I did because I, it, I feel it's absolutely critical and essential that you know that. Um, so here's, you know, what I would say is more, uh, conventional training of what most people start with and that is that operational excellence um, is flowing value okay that's what it is at its core um, we'll define what value is shortly but to put it simply it's meeting your customers needs as efficiently and effectively as possible okay so that's what operational excellence is all about now the alternative to operational excellence which would be like mediocrity, um, is what I would call um, operational chaos, okay? That's where you have a lot of non-value added processes. It's where you have a lot of waste within your processes, all right? Um, so what, what we want, obviously, is to add value. We, we don't want these non-value added steps into our business, okay? So it's going to become very important that we identify what um, waste actually is. So let's talk about waste within an operation. Um, before you can do something about waste or, or non-value-added business processes, 
you have to be able to identify it. So we will spend the rest of this training actually on how to identify waste. And here um, you can see a timeline of a, a process that starts. Um, you can see what's set up and then it works from left to right all the way to the ending operation, which is inspection. And the um, first thing we need to do is to determine what is value added and what is non-value added. Obviously, you can see I did the, the work for you here, at least starting out. Um, the value added steps would be the green boxes, right? The green boxes there, there's three of them. Um, these are processes that actually change the form, fit, and or function of the product or service. So everything else in that timeline is actually non-value added or waste. Um, setups, transporting product, staging product, waiting, inspection. Those things do not change the form, fit, or function of the product. So therefore, it is waste. And typically, in a business that hasn't done operational excellence or implemented the lean tools, 95% of the timeline in their processes are waste or non-value added. And while this may sound absolutely insane, you have to realize that not all non-value added processes can be eliminated. The goal is to reduce the amount of waste and flow the value as much as possible. And I know some of you are probably struggling with, well, how is inspection considered waste? And I'll touch on this much more in the, the yellow belt training, but for now you have to trust me. So let, let's talk about waste and defining it in all of its forms. Um, when defining all forms of waste, I like to use the acronym downtime. That helps me remember what the eight different wastes are. Um, so let's start. Defects, right? D for downtime. So defects, overproduction, waiting, non-utilized resources or talent, transportation, inventory, motion, and extra processing, okay? These represent all the forms of waste, and I'll try to give examples of all of these from different perspectives, and I'll, I'll try to throw in some personal examples, some fun stuff, some professional examples, just so you can understand um, these um, wastes from a different um, aspect, and, and hopefully it helps you see waste within your own organizations and or your personal life. So let's start out with defects. Um, so from a personal example, that might be a speeding ticket, right? If you're, you're having, having a value-added living life, um, a speeding ticket um, is certainly not that, right? It, it costs you money. Um, it's, it's something that um, no one looks forward to, and you try not to do it, right? But it, it's something that happened. It's a defect. That's an example um, from the personal side. Um, let's talk, let's talk sports, um, in, in sports, what would be a defect? Well, that would be when you have a turnover, right? You, you lose the ball to the other team. That's a defect, right? It's a turnover. Um, let's go to production. So when you make a part and it's not to specification, it's done incorrectly. Um, you know, that's, that's a defect. You have to rework it. You have to scrap it. That's, that's cost, right? It, it's waste. It's not adding value. Uh, let's go to the office. So in an office environment, um, maybe you have a report that has the wrong information. Uh, maybe it, it's made incorrectly, right? I, I always think of the movie Office Space and the TPS report, right? He hears from all of his different bosses about how he did his report wrong. That's an example of a defect. Uh, how about service? Service from the service side. Let's say your bank um, gives you a false overdraw or overdraft fee, and uh, you didn't overdraft, right? You didn't take money out, and they made an error, right? That's their defect. That's an example of a defect. Hopefully, that doesn't happen hardly ever, but it is possible. Okay, so that's um, some examples for the waste of having a defect. Let's talk about the next waste, which is overproduction. And uh, this one may not be 
intuitive to you um, for for many different reasons. But let's let's go through each scenario. So from a personal example, um, overproduction would be like overeating, right? Your body needs energy. You need to eat uh, in order to stay alive, right? So eating is value added for you personally. However, if you eat too much, um, that is also not good, right? Overproducing in the eating department is not good for uh, the you know obvious reasons. Um, let's talk sports. Um, running up the score, right? My my daughter plays on a soccer team, uh, traveling team, and sometimes when they play the recreational teams, um, they could really um, have a lot of goals, and instead of like you know winning ten to to nothing. What their coach will do is because when that happens, the, the the team neither team gets much out of it, right? One, it's for the team that's getting beat is really demoralizing, and then for the team that's winning, it, it's not even a challenge, and and it actually promotes you know sloppy play. And so instead of doing that, what they would do is um, you know practice um, passing or, or having their shape. Right, their formation as a as a team on the field uh, to perfect that, and what that allows is it eliminates the waste of um, you know the sloppy play and things like that. So that that would be an example of overproduction there. Of uh, running up the score would be an example of that. On the production side, building more than the customer ordered, or you know, just building more than your internal customer needs, and this happens a lot because um, efficiency measures, right? Um, a lot of times in standard cost systems, you earn standards for the more product you produce, so it makes you look really efficient if you're producing a bunch of product um, in your department. However, um, there's several, um, you know bad things that happens from that first of all you you may be working on something that is not needed and your customer your the next department may need something that you should be doing instead right and so it's making them inefficient so you know what when your numbers may look good the overall numbers will look bad because you're not feeding uh, the rest of the organization what they need in the right amount of quantities so that's an example of overproduction in the office environment it might be like um Maybe you handle new product development requests and also engineering changes. And it might be, you know, having your team look at all the new product development stuff first and ignoring the engineering changes, right? You're, you're overproducing on new product because you got to get those through to make your numbers look good. And then your, your engineering changes, which take a long time, um, you know, you put those in the back burner and then that, that really hinders um, flow right of of your organization's performance for your customers and so that's an example of overproduction is just focusing on um, one aspect of your business um, to to make your numbers look good another example would be in the service um, side in a doctor's office right taking on too many patients um, just to make sure that the doctor stays busy all right so that's overproduction the next waste uh, is waiting. This one is very obvious. You know, people don't struggle with this one too much. Obviously, from a personal side, um, you go to a restaurant, you're waiting on food to be prepared, right? That's an example of waste. There's no value happening while you're just sitting there waiting. Um, let's go to the sports side, right? You, you go to a baseball game, lightning strikes, you have delay of game for the weather, right? That's an example of waiting. You as the customer to observe that game, um, you're not getting that value. So you're, you're waiting on the, the weather to clear, right? That's waste. Um, from the production side, waiting on your parts. Maybe you you don't have the parts that you need. Um, you know, that's we've seen that with um, you know, the su supply chain uh, these last few years, um, trying to catch up because everyone's waiting on parts to, to get to them to order what they need. And build what they need. Um, from the office side, we're waiting on you know previous departments to process their work, right? Maybe they got paperwork that that you're waiting on in order to do your job. And then from the service side, it might be like waiting in line at an amusement park, or waiting in line at the doctor's office, or, or any other service, just waiting in line, right? At the DMV, 
Those are examples of waiting, and that is waste. All right, the next one is non-utilized resources or talent. So from the personal side, it's not doing what you love to do, right? So if you're if you hate your job, if you hate what you're doing, um, you're not utilizing your talents, your resources, your capabilities, obviously that's wasteful, right? And that's not good. We don't like that. We don't want that. We want you providing value. We want you to love doing what, what, what you do. And so um, when it's not happening, that's an example of waste. It's not utilizing your talents. Um, from the sports side, you know, not playing someone at their best position or not utilizing someone for their full skill set. Uh, from the production side, not treating employees as the experts and ignoring their ideas, right? And um, many times people think, you know, uh, we'll, we'll put in some robots. Robots, we're going to utilize this robot technology. But you got to be real careful with that. Um, you know, people, they may be an expense on, on the accounting um, finance sheet, but you know, people are your most valuable resources, and it can be um, enticing to want to um, incorporate robotics and technology like that and, and eliminate people. But if you don't have good processes, automating those processes is not going to help. Okay, you, you're still going to have waste, and so it's very important that you, you focus on pro process, utilize the people, and um, you know, apply technology where appropriate. I'll say it that way. Creativity before capital. All right. So from the office side, um, you know, software is one of those things that most people don't um, or, or, or can have waste and not utilize the, the software capabilities. So, for example, like Microsoft Excel, there's so many things that Excel can do with formulas and different things like that. Most people don't even realize that. And um, it, it can make your organization much more efficient in terms of analyzing data and crunching numbers, seeing things from a chart perspective visually. Right? There's just so much um, that you could be missing out on because you're not utilizing the software. And then uh, from the service side, it could be a, a new technology, maybe like a developmental medicine. You know, it, it could be anything like that. And, and the people as well, not utilizing the people. All right, so that is not utilizing um, resources or talent. That is a waste. Uh, the next one is transportation. So from the transportation side, from personally, that might an example of that might be driving to work, right? Um, if all you're doing is driving to work, that's really wasteful. Um, you know what I try to do is I'll I'll listen to books, videos um, that help me learn, right? I try to take that waste and make it value added, right? So that driving to work would be an example um, of a waste if you're not doing anything but driving. Um, sports, uh, maybe walk into the locker room, right? You got to walk to the locker room um, at halftime. That's time that you could be using warming up. It's time that you could be getting coached by the coach. You know, it's, it's, it's just wasted time. Um, from the production side, Sending parts from factory to factory, or to factory to store, moving parts within the factory, department to department. Anytime you're moving product, that is a waste. It's not adding value. It's not changing the form, fit, or function of the part or service. From the office, um, an example might be processing paperwork from department to department. It might be sending documentation from one area to another. Um, all that would be transportation. And then from the service side, maybe, um, you know, you're, you was referred to a chiropractor. You go to the chiropractor, they refer you to the physical therapist. You go to the therapist, they say, oh, you need to go to a doctor. And so that would be an example of you running around. That's transportation that is wasteful, right? All right, so that is the waste of transportation. The next waste is the waste of inventory. And inventory, uh, from a personal side, that might be you buying groceries, right? You have to buy groceries uh, to, to have food and stay alive, right? Seems, seems valuable. But how often do you buy those groceries? And how much money do you put into those? So from a personal finance perspective, right, the money that you have, if you went out and bought a year's worth of groceries, 
that's not good. You're spending a lot of your own cash, right? And it's getting stuck inside of all these groceries, right? You go to Walmart and buy a year's worth of uh, groceries for, you know, twenty, thirty thousand uh, dollars $30,000. First of all, you know, that's money that you could be investing and earning interest on. Um, and that's why you want to buy it just in time, right? You want to go down to maybe buying what you need for the week, for the day, um, for the next couple of days, um, that way your money is not stuck, right? You're not spending twenty or thirty thousand dollars on your your annual groceries at one time. You're you know s slowly spending that money so you can keep the bulk of your money earning interest. From the sports side, uh, let's choose uh, baseball, right? You got people on base, and those people on base, unless they score, um, that's wasted inventory, right? They're extra people. And so it's very important that you flow value, you flow those runners. You want people scoring um, and turning that inventory, right? You want inventory always turning to, to value. And so that would be an example uh, from the sports side because if, if you, you know, have bases loaded, one out, and you see this a lot in the majors, but, you know, guy hits into a double play. Well, you just lost three runners there that, um, you know, could have scored. So, and created value, and that's why inventory is not good. You always want to be turning that inventory. From the production side, um, any product that isn't sold, you have money stuck in that inventory. You, you had money that, to buy the raw material, you have money into the labor to build the product, right? And you also have money to store it, you have money to transport that product, uh, from the storage location to in the distribution center or whatever it may be. Um, you have a cost if that product goes obsolete, right, or if it was built wrong. Um, all of that inventory is not good. Um, you want your inventory to be just in time, as close to that as possible. You want it to be able to sell to the, to the, um, the customer um, as quickly after it's built as possible. From the office side, you may have like an inventory of um, problem reports in a queue or a to-do list, right? Too much on your to-do list. Again, it's it's about one need flow or one piece flow. In the office side, it's one need flow. You're, you're doing something um, that, that hits a need, right? It achieves a need. And so when you have a queue of those build up, that's inventory. That's not good. And then from the service side, um, how about too many kids in a college class or a school class, right? Um, the more kids you have, the less value you're going to provide as an instructor. And so the more one-on-one -on -one you can get, the better value you'll create. All right. The next one is motion. Um, motion is, is the most important waste because it's the one that you have the most influence over. So from the personal side, Maybe um, you you have your garage disorganized, or maybe your kitchen's disorganized, and, and your tools in your garage need it's hard to find them, right? And so that's extra motion when you're looking for these tools. Or same thing in a kitchen. I don't remember where I put my my pots, right? Where's my pot that I need? Um, or a certain size of uh, pot, right? Or pan. So those would be examples from the personal side where you're spending time um, looking for things. On the sports side, um, one of the things I always struggled with uh, was was basketball being on defense, right? I would uh, always be making too many steps on defense, and I'd always get called for a, a foul because I couldn't beat them to the spot. I'd always uh, um, use my body instead of my feet because I, I had extra motion, and um, that created uh, problems. And so on the production side, let's switch to that. So having tools and parts that are far away from you right you have to walk down the line to get your tool walk down the line to get your part that distance is what creates a problem right the distance between you and your parts and your tools creates time and that's waste that's motion on the office side you can have actual intellect intellectual distance which is also motion so for example um, we had a circuit card drawing and that drawing had like thousands of reference designators. So when you'd go to try to troubleshoot a circuit card that wasn't working, you'd have to 
um, you know, look for this, spend forever looking for this reference designator. And so what we did was created a software that actually found it quickly. And that's that created that motion reduction, that intellectual motion. Um, so it can be from, from the office side as well, not just with, you know, the production. And then from a service perspective, you know, think about a doctor doing surgery. Um, imagine having their scalpels everywhere and their equipment all over the place, right? It, they'd have to spend a lot of motion um, in between tasks, and that creates waste, and it creates a longer surgery and puts the, the patient more at risk, right? All of that is motion, which is wasteful. All right, now the last waste, which is the waste of extra processing, you know, from a from a um, personal side, um, it might be, you know, you may find some value in, in video games, right? Helps you um, relax and kind of wind down for the day. But maybe you spend 16 hours a day playing it, right? That's kind of over the top, right? Now it's become um, unnecessary and, and wasteful to other things. Uh, from the sports side, um, you know, overproducing there, it might be actually working harder than you need to right you may be working harder um, on offense than you need to you, they always say on offense you want to use that as your your moment of break right it allows you time for your body to to um, catch its breath because on defense you're always stressing your body you don't know what the the offense is going to do so on defense you're mentally um you know and physically being um, you're expending that energy, whereas on offense, um, it, there's more predictability to it, right? But maybe on offense, you're you're running around more than you need to. Um, you're doing extra things that um, aren't necessary. In production, um, it might be trying to make something too perfect, right? I, I'm laying down these weld beads, and I want it to look perfect. And, and so I have to grind this down and lay a, another bead down. Um, just to get it just right and so that might be unnecessary right the customer doesn't need it to be that perfect um, from the office side it, it might be um, having too many document approvals right um, just kind of way too many it's not necessary for that many people to be looking at all of these for approval and then from the service side um, I tell you <laughs> I don't know how many times I fill out my name, date of birth, and address on my medical forms. It just seems like there's like 10 forms and they all ask for the same thing. Um, that's all extra processing, right? Okay, Whew. eight ways. There you have them. So um, what did we learn? Well, we've learned that waste is a non-value added activity. And it can be found in all types of operations, activities, and applications. I just went through um, several different um, applications of where waste can exist with you. Um, you must learn to identify waste before it can be eliminated, because we're going to learn how to eliminate it in the next session. Um, but you got to learn how to identify it first. Um, the goal is to flow value. And remember, um, you know, value is about meeting those customer needs. And waste inhibits that, right? It's in the way of that. So that's why our, our goal is to eliminate waste and to flow value. And value is changing the form, fit, or function of a product or service, right? That's why it's important. Now, most importantly, for homework, ah, uh, yes, there's always homework. So with homework, I would like you to spend some time documenting examples of each of these wastes in your personal life and in your professional life. And from there, quantify and measure how much time is being spent on waste in your life and at work, right? And I think you'll be surprised. Like I said, in, in most businesses that, that don't have this, they run about 95% of their time is on non-value added or wasteful um, process steps and so hopefully um, you can take this and identify waste and then for next time what we'll do is learn how do you get rid of that waste okay so that concludes our second 
white belt training session. Again, this is the third video, second training session. Um, if you've enjoyed this presentation, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. Um, I expect to have the white belt training part three out very soon. So make sure you have your notifications turned on so you don't forget. Um, I'll probably do a part two follow-up. Um, so maybe keep your eyes out for that before I get into the, the third training session. But feel free to leave comments and questions or suggestions. And um, thank you. And, and we'll see you next time. God bless.